well, our next panel is Ethics and Accountability in Business. It's produced in collaboration with Adorium Partners. Now, the panel is going to be discussing how to prioritise social good when investing and building values-based companies, the effect of COVID-19 on our societies, revolutionising investment practices and how to combine impact with profit. Well, this discussion is made up um, of speakers from a range of industries and backgrounds. Your panel is going to be led by Dominic McVeigh, entrepreneur and business leader. Dominic is a British entrepreneur who started his own business at the age of just 13, importing microservices from the United States to the United Kingdom. By the age of 15, he was Britain's youngest self-made millionaire. And I'm sure, Dominic, I have you to thank for a series of scooters ridden by my kids in my driveway. Um, Dominic now runs a portfolio of business in from fashion, publishing, music to media and cosmetics. And in 2013, he purchased the Sri Lankan clothing maker Hella Clothing, where he's focused on sustainably and ethically restructuring the business. And Dominic, very pleased to have you on board today. And it gives me great pleasure to hand over to you and your panellists. Thank you, Julie. Um, pleasure to be here today. Talking on what I hope to be a very inspiring uh, panel, we are here today to really drive into the issues of ethics and accountability in business and talk about how being sustainable is not just the right thing to do it is also the smart thing to do and we are very lucky to have such a fantastic uh, host of panelists who i'm going to dive straight into introducing because i want to talk about the topics get the conversation going and hopefully inspire all of our uh, uh, viewers here today, uh, people joining us via Zoom, um, to, to leave wanting to do more, wanting to do good. Maybe if they haven't had the opportunity to start in their goals in sustainability and, and ethics within their organisations or just as individuals, will be left with some fantastic ideas from small to big, whether it's changing your uh, uh, coffee pod supplier through to thinking about how you invest as a hedge fund manager. There's going to be lots to speak about. So. I'm going to quickly introduce um, our panellists. First of all, and we're very, very lucky to have His Excellency, Mr. Manoa Esipisu, the High Commissioner of Kenya to the United Kingdom, uh, a man that is extremely busy. And I, we are lucky to have him here today because I think his workload reduced by about 1% yesterday in uh, the signing of the Kenyan and uh, British government's free trade agreement, which is not only going to be good for, for Britain and consumers, but fantastic for, for Kenya in the developing world. Um, we also have uh, Veronica Chu, the founder and CEO of Everybody and Everyone. Uh, Veronica is actually calling in from Hong Kong, um, but she spends a lot of her time between London New and New York as well. And she's a real power player on the global stage. And we're looking forward to hearing about Veronica's work and her investments in sustainability and her, her fashion brand, which she launched in 2019. We have Roxana, the founder of Possible X. Um, she's a financier. She's an artist. Um, she's over 20 professional years of experience leading financial institutions, uh, working at the EBRD, uh, Bank Pico in Poland, where she was responsible for private banking and international expansion. So really looking forward to hearing Roxana's uh, ideas and thoughts on sustainability and the actions she's taking to make the world a better place. We have Marcus Watson. He is the co-founder and CEO of Dorian Partners. Uh, Marcus, uh, really looking to understand his group and network of over 35,000 ultra high net, high net worth individuals, members, businesses, of which he's driving to make sure that they all do good and, and curates an environment where business can happen and business can happen in the right way and make sure that it's positive for planet and people. And we've got Max uh, Goschalk, who is from Ocean 14 Capital, the founding partner, in fact. And I'm looking forward to talking about SDG 14. Uh, and um, Max's focus on investing in, in the waters, making this oceans a much cleaner and safer environment, uh, where he's success and talking about his success in starting and backed, and he's operated in several private ventures. I want to hear more about that and where his pivot has gone into uh, focusing on his SDG 14, which is the oceans, making the seas of a much better habitat and environment. So, I mean, I'm going to stop talking now, and I want to hear a, a, just a brief intro from all of you, and let's. Let's start with ladies first. Uh, Roxana, um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and much more detail and grace and how I describe, apologies. Thank you, very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to debate such an important subject. 
Uh, and in fact, um, I have indeed spent uh, almost 20 years uh, being a financier, a banker, uh, but I started my journey actually working for EBRD, which is European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And what struck me at that time, I was uh, dating uh, my boyfriend, who is now my husband, who was working at Goldman Sachs. And I remember the dissonance we had because EBRD, some of you might know, is a a development bank, but also uh, a bank that has an environmental mandate. So uh, I remember asking the question, why, why are we investing in projects that are just purely profit maximizing as my husband? Or why aren't we actually caring about what we are doing to the environment? And at that time, and it was, as I say, a while back, um, working for EBRD was not considered to be like the top cutting edge because working for the investment banks was. Um, but as we now look back, kind of, I went the full circle almost. And, uh, and I guess that got me thinking, I have decided to explore also what the world of investment banking is because I believe that's the best way to learn. And uh, then I moved on to work for the American investment banks and, uh, and Swiss bank and ended up on the board of Polish bank. I'm Polish myself, so I guess that was uh, part of uh, my journey too. I wanted to give something back. Uh, and in fact, uh, at the Polish bank called PKO, I was deputy CEO, I was on the management board, uh, not to mention the only woman, of course, but, um, but what was, I tried to bring in an impact investing kind of thinking. And look, I think right now everyone is talking about impact investing, ESG, uh, if you look at the, um, at the investment and asset managers, I mean, people recognize uh, all the institutions that they have to do something about it. And it doesn't necessarily come from them, from the top. It comes very often from, from the clients who are telling them uh, that if you are not, uh, if you don't have products or if you cannot offer us these solutions, we are just simply not going to be with you, to stay with you. So, so I guess uh, it's good that it's happening. Um, and I guess there is a lot of talk, there's a lot of so-called greenwashing. So uh, lots of institutions are putting a label on something that, because they want to be perceived or doing. So, so I guess it's, it's a very complex world. Um, and, uh, and I've decided to actually leave the corporate world after uh, 20 years. And uh, really, uh, I've always wanted to uh, work on a variety of projects, uh, exciting projects with people uh, I enjoy working with. But everything throughout my current portfolio is to do with impact. So be it um, impact investing. So I'm currently chairing a board uh, for the uh, impact investing board for WITO Global Advisors. Uh, they do direct lending to SMEs. So clearly you can imagine, especially in the post-COVID world, uh, SME lending is very, very important um, to, to really, it's the backbone of the economy. And uh, White Oak has put an ESG filter on uh, pretty much all the lending or one of the funds on all the lending they do. Uh, and it's not just by excluding uh, the, the kind of investments that are not ethical, but actually going further. Um, I'm also an artist, so I actually believe that through art you can make an impact. So I'm creating a series of sculptures that are uh, connected to global sustainable goals. Uh, as I believe that through art we can actually visualize. Um, and also, I think it's important to, um, to also give hope. So rather than, so, so I always came from the point of view of rather than preaching and telling us how bad it is. Uh, you know, look, this is where we are, but what can we do about it? Um, and sometimes subjects like uh, climate change can be overwhelming because you think as an individual, what can I do? Okay, maybe I become more kind of conscious and, you know, I look what I consume, but actually everyone can make a difference. And I think the financial world, uh, so putting money, and even it starts with a retail, so an investor that, you know, all of us or most of us probably will have a pension. So you can look, where is my pension going? You know, you, you can actually yourself be the client who is making a difference uh, and looking in, a, in an ethical way uh, and considerate way in what we do. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the other projects I'm involved in is working with Oliver Stone on his latest documentary on nuclear power. It could be a bit controversial subject, but it's about really looking at the energy space and demystifying nuclear power. Uh, that is currently um, uh, and only available at scale uh, energy, uh, clean energy. So, so really, I guess in my all my focus right now is uh, on all these different subjects through, I guess, my knowledge I've accumulated for um, working in finance and working in the creative world. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here, Roxana. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your experiences. Marcus uh, Watson, the CEO and founding partner of Adorim. Marcus, can you tell us a bit about your network and the work Adorim does? Because I've seen over the years how you've led and really tried to pivot sustainability, ethics and compassion at the core of your membership and the businesses that you invest in and work in. I mean, could you talk to us a bit about that change and what you've seen and, and tell us how Dorian works in this space of helping those new to sustainability and ethics and, and what you really see as the potential in, in the future? Yeah, I mean, my background originally, like Roxana's, is actually in investment banking. So I, I started out there from, from university, but only kind of lasted a few years because Although it was great grounding for business, I just didn't feel that it was it was collaborative, and it certainly wasn't wasn't compassionate. Um, and I left to set up an internet company in the late '90s, kind of Web 1.0. And I've been been an entrepreneur ever since. Um, I founded Adorium in uh, 2009, um, initially as a consultancy, kind of helping brands understand how to connect with high net worth and ultra net worth individuals, and. And we've kind of evolved into becoming what we call ourselves now a network and a, and a, a, a corporate, corporate venture uh, business. So we invest our own capital in early stage companies. We create companies with talented management um, and we, we kind of help the companies and the charities that we support through the network that we've, that we've developed. I mean, I, I would say there's been, a, there's been a big kind of shift um, over the last, certainly the last 10 years, but probably throughout my entire career of, of people being more focused, I think, on, um, on uh, compassion, compassion for the environment and compassion for each other. And Adorium as a network is all about kind of bringing collect and, and, and that's, that's kind of what we strive to do. I mean, we strive to find companies that are really making a difference, making a difference to um, to the environment and making a difference to society at, at large. So, you know, that's, I'm, I'm passionate about, about compassion. Well, thank, that's, thank you. Um, that's, um, that's I mean, talking point. about companies making a difference, Veronica, I'd really like to hear about the work that you've been doing globally uh, and the difference that that's making and the impact you're seeing it's have, having and, and, and how you're measuring that and maybe explain a little bit to the audience uh, in, in more detail of, of how you got started as well. Hi everyone, I'm Veronica. Um, I grew up going to my family's factories in knitwear and denim and asking why is it so dusty? Where is this colored water going? And experiencing pollution firsthand, but that was just the way things were. And my first business was opening mass market American brand stores in China, where it was walking out of a plane and walking into a cloud of particles in the air and um, seeing pollution that way. And those are the early experiences of mine that got me into sustainability. I mean, almost eight years ago now, and um, I've been working in the sustainability space, especially in fashion, and also um, I've been investing in um, innovation and material science that um, helps with um, our climate crisis, especially in fashion. And then I launched my um, eco-innovative size inclusive brand last year, and um, the brand uses material science and practical design to maximize the life of clothes and to minimize our impact on the planet. And um, what I really see, especially with material science is sometimes I call it like magic because we can make things in a way where it's much, much, much less harmful to the planet. And sometimes even where, where it can be actively doing good. And um, there is the material science, high tech, biotech side of things, but then there's also traditional ways um, of making things where um, we give back to both people and planet. And um, I, I really think that we have to look into our overall consumption. And so um, in terms of um, investment, we also invest in um, all the different things along the value chain, whether it's 
from um, 3D technology in designing clothes or to um, 3D technology that can help reduce returns um, or other um, technologies along the supply chain where um, it helps with um, reducing waste and um, as I said, new materials. And so um, that's kind of the world that I look at with a skew towards fashion and a little bit outside of the non-fashion world. Yeah. Well, thank you, Veronica. Um, and we'll be coming back to that because very keen, as I said, these inspiring stories to see that we can make sure our audience here today is able to leave with some actionables. Um, but we, we've spoken about, uh, uh, we've had introductions from the world of business, two from the banking sector, uh, Veronica from industry. We'll, we'll come to Max and understand about hedge funds, but I'd love to introduce now His Excellency, Mr. Manar Esopisu, the High Commissioner uh, up to, uh, of Kenya to the United Kingdom and really understand the role and work that he's doing from his perspective as for his country, but also working with business. And I have had the pleasure and honor to be an investor in Kenya and living and working there at times as well. Uh, and just blown away by uh, a developing country leapfrogging the developing world in its, its commitments to sustainability and challenging plastic pollution. So Manoa, it's a pleasure to have you here and thank you for giving up your time. Uh, and, and please, if you could just give a brief introduction and uh, sh share some examples which we can we can dig into as, as we move forward with the panel. I, I think you're on mute, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah exactly. One of those. Uh, thank you, Dominic, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, and thank you to uh, Adoram and Athena for uh, putting this together. Uh, so I'm the only one who's not from the financial world, as you might have guessed already. Uh, I began work in Nairobi, working for Reuters as a, a business journalist. So that is the convergence between myself uh, and business and investment. And I covered the economies of Africa for uh, just over a decade, uh, focusing on emerging markets and focusing on trade. Uh, so I would say 20 years ago, I was uh, in Doha when the Doha round of trade talks was being discussed, never been completed, uh, but uh, it's given us some of the things about which we still talk now about ethical trade, about fair trade, about ensuring that people uh, are at the center of everything you do. I then worked for the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, in London uh, as spokesperson and the Commonwealth uh, are, among its many things is concern and work for small states, uh, small vulnerable states uh, who uh, face challenges with uh, climate change, uh, who are impacted by a lack of scale in, 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 in production and who are impacted by the problems many developing countries face, which is the big disparities between rich and poor, as well as lack or diminishing opportunities for, uh, for, for, for vulnerable groups in uh, its communities, especially uh, women, uh, young people, uh, people with disabilities. And then I worked with the African Development Bank for, a, for nearly a year. Uh, the closeness, the closest to me, uh, smelling the cash around the building. Uh, but the bank dealt, deals mainly with infrastructure and we saw lots of the good work it's doing to ensure that you can connect, you can link markets uh, in Africa to, you can link production in Africa with markets in the developing world, as well as the important work of promoting regional integration with the original economic groups in East Africa, in South, Southern Africa, in West Africa, in North Africa. Uh, now they, they're working on the continental free trade area, which is already come into fruition. And then working with the president of Kenya for uh, five years as a spokesperson, uh, really at the center uh, of uh, planning for, for our, countries, uh, our country's growth our country's future and looking at it, the things that really make a, a turnaround in fortune possible. So how do you leapfrog, uh, uh, how do you leapfrog uh, 
uh, technology to deliver value to your citizens. So, you know, the big jump from, uh, from, from, from landlines to mobile telephony, for instance, the ability for you to get uh, internet available in local villages, for instance, uh, the ability to get more electricity available so that people can run sustainable businesses, uh, the ability to uh, develop, to, 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 to implement the, te the mobile telephone, uh, uh, mobile banking, so your M-Pesa type of te technology, and using technology to ensure farmers can read uh, what markets are like and produce to specific uh, times and to, to specific places in the right manner at the right time. Uh, so those things have been uh, critical along the way to getting me to the job in which I am, uh, which is uh, ensuring that I am the link between business and, uh, and, and the Kenyan market, uh, ensuring that I'm the link between the government of the UK and the Kenyan government, and ensuring that the issues that you face as business, we can resolve as government, or we can work together to ensure that at the end of it, it's about uh, people, the Kenyan people uh, have their interests protected, safeguarded, that the most vulnerable people, uh, women and young people get the opportunities they deserve, that fair wages are are available even when the, the market conditions are difficult and that you as business don't face unnecessary roadblocks to investing. So part of my work is to ensure that I can dismantle those roadblocks when they emerge by linking the right, the right people to, uh, to solve your uh, problems with business and to ensuring that as a country, we are taking all the right decisions in order to ensure that really no roadblocks exist to, to fostering growth. Uh, so, so Dominic, briefly, that's, 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 that's me. Well, 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 thank you, Mino. And I'm keen to come back to you to learn more about what types of sustainable businesses Kenya is encouraging and where you're seeing the markets shift, what kind of businesses are interested in sustainability in Africa. But I must, uh, I must move on to Max. And um, Max, it was very interesting to hear about uh, His Excellency's work when he was at the Commonwealth, speaking of smaller nations and how the oceans and climate change has a major impact on, on them. I, I'm really keen to hear about uh, the SDG 14, your support in your fund and your work you're doing and, and how that potentially is going to protect small island nations and coastal communities. Yes, so um, just as a way of background, so I've been in the asset management industry now for 25 years and uh, grew up as a financial engineer, so very much looking at financial data and analytics. And uh, my way into impact really came uh, through the back door, so to speak, meaning through philanthropy. And in the last few years, uh, working very closely with a number of ocean-related philanthropic groups just realized that there is a huge lack of capital uh, going towards ocean conservation. So only about 0.5% of the money donated each year goes towards ocean conservation. And so it's really a little trickle compared to the vast problems that the ocean is fa facing in terms of pollution, overfishing, and so forth. So um, together uh, with the founders of the Blue Marine Foundation in the UK, we started to um, brainstorm as to whether we can make the ocean investable. And what's very clear is that if you wanna attract capital, philanthropic money is in one pocket, but if you can tap into the dollars of traditional investors uh, by providing investment products that can generate very competitive financial uh, returns, uh, you may be able to channel money in the direction of the right projects and initiatives. And so we went down that, that path. And the path was really around trying to understand, can you make money and do good at the same time? Can you, you, know, can you generate a financial return and can you generate a, uh, an environmental uh, return at the same time? And so that's sort of the journey we've been down uh, for the last few years. 
Um, and what's very encouraging, I think we are in a, in a point in time where we're seeing a real transition in investors' allocation towards more uh, sustainable products, ESG products, trillions of dollars have been flowing in this direction, and more recently into impact. And as I come from this, call it financial uh, return and uh, financial engineering sort of world, and I've been looking at impact as a way to um, you know, uh, quantify it and then report it, and to report it in a way we can create a direct link between financial investment and the environmental generated from that investment. It's led me down the road of trying to think as to whether nature can be valued. I mean, there's a lot of work being done in this space, but what's very exciting and from the work we're currently seeing is that we can, we, we can see the light. We think that you can invest in a company that's very profitable, that can generate a very good environmental impact, but that environmental impact, in our opinion, can be valued and monetized down the road, generating additional financial gain for investors. And the reasons that, and I know I'm not answering directly the question to the smell fishing, but the reason why we believe this is really important is because this is, in our mind, the key to unlock large sums of capital to go towards impact-friendly investments. So in terms of, you know, when we sort of think about impact, uh, we all very often think about the delta of change, right? When you think of the blue economy, when you think of fisheries, of aquaculture projects, of seaweed farms, of alternative fish protein, we continuously seek to find ways to make the investments we're investing more sustainable, introduce technology to make them more profitable and less damaging to the environment. So it's a really exciting place to be. We think our focus is very much in the environmental aspect, which we think is we need fish, to feed people, we need uh, the ocean to create oxygen and CO2 to be sequestered. So we're very driven towards climate change objectives and food security for the planet. And so that ultimately uh, drives down, you know, when you think about coastal areas and small villages and small islands, which rely both on tourism and on fishing, right? When if you overfish it and there's no fish and people don't come because they like scuba diving, there's a real work that needs to be done in creating sustainable reserves, marine protected areas, introduce sustainable fishing practices, which provides a more consistent and reliable fish stock over time that could be more profitable. So this huge, I don't, that is this huge opportunity, we believe, in particular in the ocean space in terms of helping communities uh, overall. Uh, uh, thank you for that introduction, Max. And I'd, I'd be keen to explore the Kenyan coastline and, and, and some of the projects you're doing and how they might positively impact the people of Kenya. And we have uh, the right individuals here, but I'm you know, following from what Max said, Marcus, just, um, I wanted to ask you, you know, you have a lot of, of investors come to you for, for opportunities. You also have a lot of businesses come to you looking for investors. How many of them are now becoming sophisticated enough to understand what Max is talking about and valuing the impact to planet and, and uh, people and understand that, that sustainability is the way to go forward? So, are, are you seeing the sophistications levels there that one would hope, or are you having to, to hold their hand and take them through the, through, through the journey of understanding ethics and how you must be accountable for the investments you make today? Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's a, there's, as I said earlier, there's a kind of paradigm shift, I think, in, in terms of, um, you know, companies and how they think about sustainability and ethics. Um, you know, we, we, we invest primarily in kind of early stage companies founded by kind of young entrepreneurs and, you know, younger people definitely kind of seem to be much more in tune with ethics and accountability, I believe. Um, I mean, one of the things that we did uh, last year was we created a, a summit called Modern Affluence, which was about, you know, helping luxury brands and financial services brands and, and, uh, and lifestyle brands understand kind of affluent younger people. So millennials, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, um, because, because we knew from kind of working with, with luxury brands that a lot of them actually, this is going back, you know, over the years really just didn't understand that market because the values of that kind of younger audience are, you know, are different. You know, they're very values based. They're very kind of ethics, ethics based. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, sure enough, what came out of that, because we, we created a, a white paper off the back of that event, we had some incredible kind of very successful, you know, millennial speakers like yourself, Dominic, talking at that event. And what, what was absolutely clear is if you, if you want to be successful, you want to sell products and services um, to younger people, you know, you have to have the right values. Um, if, if you don't, you're going you're gonna to really struggle. So, you know, being responsible and ethical, actually, you know, it makes, it makes, it makes financial sense. I think, you know, those kind of larger corporates, medium sized corporates, and maybe some smaller companies as well, who, you know, who aren't, they're really going to struggle um, going forward, because, because the audience, you know, demands it, you can't pull the wool over their eyes, they really, they really do understand, you know, the company's values now. I mean, uh, Veronica, I see you nodding. Uh, I see all of you nodding, agreeing with Marcus. But, you know, Veronica, you, you, you've come from a place of passion, but also grown up in a business environment. How, how difficult was it for you to, to learn the difference between good and, and better? Um, you know, going from the, 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 the wonderful values that you grew up with and then taking them to the next level and also ascertaining what was right for you. And, and how, I, I'd be keen for the audience to understand what, process do you go through in your mind to say this is a business i'm going to invest in this is a space i'm going to invest in and these are the key measures of ethics and accountability that are, 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 are my lines in the sand you know how did you formulate those, that thinking around this um following yeah. on board. i was not first of all i agree completely with what marcus said that brands um need to have a purpose be purpose driven and consumers are buying more into sustainability and you know that definitely drives the bottom line if brands don't believe in these things consumers will not buy and and that's a big thing but also when we look into like the factory level for example if we find ways to reduce water usage or we find ways to reduce electricity usage that also um, improves the, the cost structure and um, also then is also again better for business um, and then for myself um, through my journey, I think um, I there's moments where I struggled because making a piece of clothing that's sustainable, everything's around 15 to 20 percent more expensive in terms of the labels or the fabrics. And then there's moments like, oh, no, like, how are we going to work this out? Then I go ahead and continue the journey. And one, I believe in the purpose, but also I see that there are new technologies and ways to do things where it's not just less bad. For example, going from um, cotton to organic cotton is less bad, but then there's also ways which are actively doing good. We have a silk product, which is done with um, regenerative organic agricultural methods. And when we grow the mulberry trees for the silk, we sequester more carbon into the soil, we protect the topsoil, and um, protecting topsoil is super important in case you don't know, we, we will run out of proper topsoil in 60 years and we won't have food to eat. Um, so that's very important. Um, and the third part is the farmers that are growing these crops, they do rotational cropping, and therefore they make more money throughout the year um, than what they did before where they were just um, making money on one crop. And with COVID, it actually showed a lot more because um, their neighbors who were not doing regenerative agricultural methods suddenly had a big drop, like everything stopped and they didn't have income. But with um, rotational cropping, regenerative agriculture, they were able to sell different products throughout the year and um, kind of sustain their livelihood. So this definitely is a way where it's good for people and again, for planet. Hey, Roxana, following on from what, what Veronica was saying, I know you're working with uh, uh, SMEs and, and, and much smaller organizations. And Veronica talks about the farmers, the smallholders. You know, are we able through, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it micro lending, but the smaller levels of lending you're speaking about, to, uh, to, or can we access enough people to make a difference? Or do we need to go back to the likes of the EBRD and uh, the, the African development banks and say infrastructure is one thing and your ethics and sustainability is, is applauded but what can we do to drive down the change to, to smaller individuals? The infrastructure is, is there or is coming up, but if we don't have the crop to grow and the soils there, uh, the infrastructure will be um, a, a ghost town, so to speak. I mean, you've sit, sat on both sides. You've sat on the big bank and you're, you're working on the more impact for the individuals. What is the balance that we're missing or what do you think is the right direction that we are, we are going in to achieve that? Look, I think uh, bottom line, it is a very complex issue. 
now uh, what there is a mega trend right now and there's no denial all the asset managers all the capital realizes that there is just no turning back so in terms of looking and being um, being conscious where we are putting the money for now the look it has to come from it's it's a mind mind mindset shift but there is at the end of the day if the big institutions and big asset managers are not required and they do not have to disclose have to uh, do certain disclosures and it's not demanded from them it's part of what they have to do then bottom line that the, the the change will be driven much slower and obviously it's changing there is a big shift that's that's been happening for many years and it's accelerating so there is new legislation coming uh, to force next year so companies EU will be required to disclose uh, let's say carbon footprint and so on so clearly that all the changes have to come from uh, from so many different levels and it is both the government uh, but also driven by the consumer as well but i would say one or the other is not enough it all has to come uh, from from different parts now you know 15 years ago the concept of risk return was born so you look at the investment and you say okay we are looking at the risk adjusted return so called and it became a standard everyone is using it everyone is measuring their uh, their risk adjusted returns and what's happening now we are introducing a triangle so there will be risk return impact and that will also become a standard so clearly there's no standards standards as today they are different institutions different bodies trying to create these but it's a work in progress so so how we are talking about risk adjusted returns today that will be hopefully uh happening very soon that we'll be discussing uh each project based on that triangle and it's really it's really that so it's it's a is the drive, the change has to be driven from all these different levels. Now, look, I've been in big institutions, I've been on the board, uh, there is lots of uh, bureaucracy, every process is taking forever. So really, until a big institution is, is not forced to disclose it, that the change will be very slow. Uh, now, um, I'm indeed now uh, looking at uh, supporting SMEs and um, and that we all realize that SMEs, the health of the SMEs, is really the backbone of economies. They are our hope. So so I think you know what's 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 what positive changes. It's it's not now good to have. We know it's actually both financially viable, and this is the future. So so I think the shift has happened, and I think it's really now for a consumer looking from let's say what. And I I, I touched upon that as an investor, as a pension holder, you know, I want to understand where is my pension going? You know, I don't want to support certain companies. So actually we all have the tools now. So it's partly education as well. So, so I think clearly even debating this uh, panel and, you know, listening to all the, all the different points of view, you know, what Max is doing with oceans, you know, I think it's that, that will become, you know, mainstream, but. Uh, Agreed. And, and Max, I mean, uh, Roxana spoke there about the risk reward, uh, the, the measuring the impact. Can, can you give us an example of one of your businesses where you went in, it was a negative impact on society and it's, it's moved to a positive impact or where one of your investments has, has helped society shift um, in, in, in its examples. And I mean, it'd be really useful for the audience to understand how you, how you look at your achievements on impact, not just your achievements at a financial line and how you may correlate that. Yes. So Roxana is very interesting because when I sat down and looked at impact, the first thing I thought is there needs to be a measurement tool that can, everybody can understand. And so what led me into this valuation of impact is through the ability to create ratios. So you're talking risk adjusted return, you're talking about a sharp ratio, right? return divided by volatility. I'm like, can I create an impact ratio? I investment may impact generated divided by the same number, you know, same kind of number that gives you an impact ratio. And that's what sort of led the way into the work we're doing. So it's very much into trying to understand at each underlying company level, what are the pathways to impact and how we can contribute towards working with the underlying companies to achieve that particular impact. So one of the impact 
And when, that, when we think about ocean, so at the, at the higher level, we look at all of the ESG factors, but as an ocean fund, we're quite, really, you know, we're quite focusing on, on the E rather than the S and the G. But I'll give you an example on an, on an environmental impact. We've been looking at uh, seaweed farms, right? So seaweed is, is a growing industry, it's a very profitable industry and you grow seaweeds in the oceans, you harvest it, you package it and you sell it as a food supplement. And what people have found is that if you include a certain strand of seaweed and feed it to cows, then they emit a lot less methane uh, emission. So if you give 1% input of in the food of a cow, you can reduce emission up to 95%. So these are big impacts, right? But then that's that's what I call the secondary impact from the products that are being delivered from our investments. But when I looked at the seaweed farms, I'm like, uh, seaweed sequests CO2, right? Can we measure the amount of CO2 sequestered from underlying farms? And the answer is yes. So if you can measure it, then you can audit it. And then you can report it. And I can say to my investors, through our projects, we have sequestered so many tons or megatons of CO2 over the life of the investment. Now, when I, when I sort of looked at that number based on that particular project, and I sort of valued CO2 at $20 a metric tons, I sort of realized I could recover a big chunk of my investments just by sending the CO2 to my underlying project. So we not took talking social here, we're talking environmental. But we, and, and one of the point really is that we are going over the next decade to a decarbonization of our planet. Uh, everyone signed up to the Paris Treaty. The US is coming back. Biden is going to push really hard for the environment, we hope and believe. And companies and corporates now have all um, agreed to reach target neutrality by 2030, 2040. So we have a real roadmap for commitments to bring the world to zero carbon emission by a certain amount of time. And so the development of the carbon market is going to be very critical in that. Uh, the transparency that investors are now requiring from their companies in terms of their carbon footprint is becoming really important. Companies are now being rated not only by the ESG factor, but they rate them by what they call a temperature. Are you a one and a half degree company or you are half a degree company? And capital is now flowing away from the bad businesses into the better businesses. And so uh, I hope I sort of addressed your question there, but this is sort of what's sort of driving, I think a lot of that opportunity that I think will bring, you know, the changes that's needed to bring the carbon consumption down materially. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely fantastic, Max. And um, you know, hats off to you in, in playing your role in reducing the carbon footprint and also making uh, cattle farming more sustainable in terms of the methane. I mean, Your Excellency, we, we've got some really interesting comments here. We've got Veronica talking about her work in, in agriculture uh, and Max talking about the seas. Uh, two major factors for, for Kenya. Climate change is, is impacting in the north of Kenya. You grow the best tea in the world, um, which uh, I think 60% of people in the UK are drinking Kenyan tea at any one time uh, when they're sipping away on their uh, various brands. And of course, the, the, the ocean, the Indian Ocean uh, is where, where a lot of your fish is, is some of the most pristine oceans. What investors are coming? And, and, and I know that the, the president has put sustainability, green energy at the top of his uh, agenda. So naturally, that attracts the good guys, the, the half a degrees, not the 1.5 degrees to, to Kenya as an investment. But what trends are you seeing? Um, and, and how is the environment that you, your government has created enabled that and what positive changes are you seeing? From a, from a country perspective, I think it'd be fantastic to hear how doing good has done good for Kenya. Uh, yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Dominic. I think first, we've got the focus on, on green energy and Kenya has got the most green credentials on the African continent and fares fairly well in global terms. 80% uh, of our power is from renewable sources. Uh, and increasingly, uh, it's, it's getting cheaper because of the diversified array of, of generation sources. 
it means that we can focus on businesses looking to production at lower energy uh, costs uh, in, in the coming years, uh, which then, uh, first of all, improves their green credentials uh, as well as uh, the reliability, reliability of power. Uh, in many of our in the, of our cities, uh, regular cuts are not the order of the day, as you know they are in among some of our neighbours as well as in the rest of the continent. Uh, secondly, uh, innovation uh, uh, we are at the heart of innovation in, in uh, I think in our continent. Uh, the uh, technology is fairly well advanced. Uh, internet connections are often faster in Nairobi, in parts of Nairobi than they are in London, for instance. Uh, and, and we are just able to say, in terms of promoting uh, uh, a business that, that is tech best, we, we really go, uh, how, how, how have that going. Uh, we have the most educated young population on the continent. Uh, we intend to keep it that way. Uh, we invest a lot in education because we believe uh, anyone that has a decent education is going to be able to, to adapt uh, in many situations. So not necessarily in the area in which you have trained, but you can be deployed across a whole range of, of careers uh, if, if, if you have a decent education. So investment in education really has to continue. And I think lastly on the blue economy, because that's the forgotten frontier for, uh, for many on our continent, definitely one that we hadn't done much about. Uh, but this, the president is focusing very much on this to try to get industry around, uh, around fisheries, to try to use, to use more of our coastal resources and to ensure that we can build a decent, uh, a, a decent industry around our coastal reaches. Uh, I think these things, we, we've got to look to work uh, with, uh, with businesses uh, to invest in these areas and to ensure that we can uh, put on the plate, uh, on, on the menu, uh, a, a variety of incentives, a variety of, uh, of deals that make it attractive for investors to come to Kenya which is part of why we've worked very hard on the ease of doing uh, business. As you know, we've jumped uh, 36 places in the last five years uh, to around to 56 uh, from 80 before, or just above 80. Which uh, is so in Italy. It's easier to do business in Kenya than it is to do in Italy and Luxembourg, I'm told. On yeah, the exactly. So we, we, we're making the right, the right moves in, in, in ensuring that it's easier to do business uh, on, in our shows. And of course, uh, I think th th this has helped to attract some, some investors. We hope it can attract more because really at the end of the day, that's what you need, you need to do. And I think the last thing is to say the, the, the empowerment uh, of women. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's an important thing for Kenya because women are at the heart of the growth of communities, especially in our case, um, most of our population is rural based and really women are at the heart of leadership of rural communities as, as much as they are, at the, uh, at the, they are in front uh, in leading uh, is, is a more cosmopolitan communities. So empowerment of women uh, as part of the design to, to grow our country uh, is, is really important for us. Well, well I mean, it's, it's excellent to hear and you know, I myself as an investor can uh, attest to the, the positive environment that's been created in Kenya. But Veronica, you're, you're, you're a global investor. Uh, you're a global citizen. Are you finding governments are doing enough when you're looking to make a difference? Do they get the issues? Do they, are they targeting the, the, the circular economies, the green initiatives? Or do you find you're very frustrated when looking at new frontiers or new states in, in countries that we may all be very familiar with. It's a government's doing enough. What, 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 what can change to make life easier? I definitely don't think governments are doing enough. Um, I'm currently back in Hong Kong. There barely is a recycling program for even just plastic bottles here. 
and that's very sad. Um, it should be an easy place to do because everyone's so living so close together. Collection should be easy, but there's not a good program. And I think um, across the world, we're seeing that um, a lot of times. And I think governments don't realize that if they move towards a green economy, how many jobs and how much opportunities um, that can create. Um, so Dominic, you help us out. Get the let's get more governments on on board and, and make more changes. <laughs> Well, you know, we there are there, we are lucky. You know, we are lucky to have the likes of, of Kenya and and others which do understand the importance because climate change is affecting them directly. You know, I'm sure His Excellency can talk of examples in the north of Kenya where drought is is causing uh, you know close to famine in certain situations. Um, so it's in the developing world, and as Max has touched on about the island nations and coastal communities knows more than anyone the importance and is really stepping forwards and, and leapfrogging. And it's the G20 that uh, I feel that we have to shake up more. Uh, they haven't seen it for themselves. They, it, it gets glossed over or, or, or covered up in some ways. But if you're living in uh, the Maldives, you can see the oceans are rising. It's, as I said, if you're in Northern Kenya, it's getting pretty dry out there. Um, in, in other parts of the world, the, 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 the unpredictability of of climate is causing chaos for farmers. And traditionally they live by their understanding of nature, but that understanding has moved away. And there might be uh, illiterate farmers who now need to be able to understand weather patterns and, and be provided with weather information. And that causes extra challenges and barriers for them. Um, so I, I feel our, 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 our focus has to be those that haven't really felt it yet or don't see it yet. Um, it's, we often have people talking about uh, those in the poorer countries without ha ever having been to the poorer countries and people fighting for climate change and, and thank God people are fighting for climate change but what's the collaboration on it what's the common goal I've spent time in refugee camps I've spent time in climate uh, ridden environments where, where flash floods have caused huge damage or drought has caused extreme poverty and famine so, uh, but we can't ex put everyone on a plane to go and see it to make it better because that would just be an, another disaster. And this is why voices like yourselves, uh, Roxana, Max, Veronica, Marcus connecting with the 35,000 community at Adorium really can empower us because we are the advocates, we're the travelers, we are the change makers and we need more change makers alongside us um, to, to wave that flag and make a difference. So, um, I'm, I'm conscious that we only have about eight minutes left and there was people wanting to ask questions. Um, but I also have so many questions to ask of you all myself. Um, but we, the chat function has been slightly disabled, so there's nothing here. But I mean, it would be really good to, in closing remarks, maybe two minutes each for you to, to, to summarize your feelings um, with everything that's been going on and everything that's discussed, which hopefully will leave some of our audience to say, or all of our audience to say, I'm going to, uh, tomorrow I'm going to stand up and make a difference as well. And then we'll go into Q&A, which will open up. So let's fire off two minutes each. Marcus. So, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I genuinely think there's a lot to be positive about. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of what I, what I really want to bring front and center. It's not, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, the, the younger generation really are focused on, on kind of sustainability, um, on ethics. And, and I think there's loads to be positive about. I'm, I'm meeting, you know, every week I'm meeting some incredible young entrepreneurs who, who really are thinking about, about sustainability. They really are thinking about kind of social impact. So, you know, I'm excited. I think, you know, this year has been such a, you know, an awful year for so many people. But in many respects, you know, um, Andy Oric, one of our partners, kind of described it as kind of Mother Earth sending us to our rooms to think about what we've done to the planet. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what's happened. I think a lot of people have taken a step back from their, you know, their their kind of busy lives and and started to think about, you know, how, how they want to leave their li lead their lives going forward and how they want their children um, to, to lead their lives in the future. So there's there's loads to be positive about. I'm seeing some some phenomenal kind of companies driven by some phenomenal entrepreneurs who are really focused on um on ethics so um so yeah no i think i think next year is going to be exciting i think things are think things are going to get better roxana so like marcus actually i'm also an optimist and and i would say 
you know, in, in, in anything that happened this year, obviously has been a tough year for many, but also did allow us to kind of um, shift our mindset and kind of slow down. And, and I had so many discussions with friends who said, oh my God, for the first time I had the opportunity to actually think and, and experience nature. So, you know, there's always a learning in, in all the challenges. And I would say, you know, the message probably from me is that, look, you don't need to be an expert. Uh, you don't need to necessarily have all the knowledge, but I think everyone can make a difference. I mean, you can study, you can talk to other people. Uh, compassion is very important to me as well. So I think even from the financial point of view, I mean, I'm just reading a book called Investing to Save the Planet. It's a very uh, nicely written book by Alice Ross. And uh, I think if anything, start educating yourself as well. So, so I think we really, an individual can make a difference. And even, you know, putting a small group of people um, that have got, um, that can make an impact and be an ambassador, as Dominic, you said, I think we definitely, I think I, I feel encouraged and, and um, energized. So thank, thank you. you for the opportunity today. Thank you, uh, Max. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think we all are singing from the same song sheet, right? Meaning we wouldn't be here if it wasn't uh, for the fact that we're a great believer in this revolution that's taking place. I think that, you know, the world has woken up. Uh, this impact investment theme or ESG themes is here to stay for the long term. I think everyone is now consuming investing uh, and looking at the world in a very different way, right? I think that uh, it's very encouraging. I think that uh, for Roxana, I think the COVID has really allowed, uh, you know, governments to rethink their spending policy. Uh, trillions or hundreds of billions of dollars are now being uh, pumped into uh, renewable projects and green investments. So, you know, there's hope, right? I think uh, reaching the 1.5 degree target set by the Paris Treaty remains extremely challenging. Uh, but I think that everyone from consumer to investors are willing to play a role in this. And so uh, it's an exciting time. I'm glad to be part of it. Thank you. Uh, Veronica, and also Veronica, I'm going to give you a question that's come in uh, <laughs> as you close as well. Someone's talking about what can we do about hangers in the fashion industry, given that 16% of the billion hangers used a year Dominic, Dominic, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I'm like the grim reaper of time here, but unfortunately we've come to the end of the session just as you were about to ask that question. Maybe there's a way um, to answer that question um, off screen so that whoever asked it can, um, can get whatever goodies they need. Thank you so much, all of you, um, for joining us. Um, there was so much joy in listening to you all. I, I can't remember who it was said that they felt energized and encouraged, and I certainly did. So an enormous thanks to all of you. We've got our second keynote speech of the day coming up in just a couple of minutes. Dominic and all your colleagues, thank you. Thank you, thank you guys, thank you.